This is Nan McKay, and I saw you perform, so to speak, at the Tucson Festival of Books and was very impressed with your background. You have been a mountain climber in the past and a fire department paramedic and even a police sergeant, and now you're a writer. That is quite a varied career. Tell me about this. What was your journey and how did you get there? It's been quite an experience and it, it was a sequential. There were reasons why everything happened when it did. Um, we moved to Alaska when I had about a year to go in high school and I turned that year into just a semester, but oh, Alaska mountains like you've never seen. And of course you start mountain climbing. And of course, if you start mountain climbing, you want really good first aid skills. So I took an ENT class and part of that was a ride along with paramedics. I was, oh, 18 years old, 19. And it was pretty easy to go, hey, paramedics, this is a cool job. It's kind of outdoors, but it's smart. And it was just a work, way to work 10 days a month. You could get in um, less than a year of training if you worked really hard. And I did that. Well, the next jump was going to the PD because when you're at the fire department, you realize you're in a very reactive job. You know, outside of every possible medical or traumatic emergency and non-emergency, it is still the same work every day and it's waiting for the work. You live in a fire station and then the bell rings and you go and fix somebody's problem and then you go back to the fire station. It's very reactive. The police department's not like that, it's very proactive, and there's a much greater variety of the sorts of jobs you can do. Even just within patrol, depending on the shift you work and the area of town you work, it's a very different job. And then going to detectives, oh, the whole world, there's person's crimes and property crimes and vice crimes, and I did it all. And then I went well, back to the street. Was this when you were still in Alaska? All of that was in Alaska. The climbing, well, I, I did climbing expeditions down in South America because one does want to escape around December or January. <laughs> but the Southern Hemisphere is summer when you're in Alaska. But yes, Alaska was good to me. I loved it. I was born the day of their quake, and I married a man who was born in the territory of Alaska. Wow. So what city were you in? Anchorage for the most part. I also lived in Wasilla at times. So what were some of the biggest challenges that you had? Tell me about some of the cases that you had that were hard to work with. Well, when I was a detective, I was in crimes against children. And um, in the latter half of my career, one of my specialty assignments was as a hostage negotiator. And all of those jobs have very special challenges. Uh, one of my detective assignments for crimes against children was vice. So I used to buy crack undercover. And as a woman, it is expected by every drug dealer in the world that when a woman goes to buy crack or any drug, um, I'm also willing to barter sex mm -hmm. for that purchase. So I have had some of the most disgusting and sleazy conversations you could possibly imagine. <laughs> that's, that's just a hard, weird side of the world that I, as a really straight kid, had never been into drugs, wasn't interested. Those weren't my friends. It was just not part of my world at all. I remember a jury laughing at me once when a defense attorney was sort of mocking me on the stand saying, now how is it you remember all these details? And I'm saying, you know, this is an odd experience for me buying drugs. I had never bought drugs until I was a cop. <laughs> That's interesting. And did you, uh, how did you, prepare to go out and do that? Did you just kind of go out on the street and do it or? Yeah, well, by that time I had seen a lot. You've been on patrol before you go to detective. So I have dealt with a lot of people who had been in that world and been in that life and, and you talk to them and they're interesting people. I'm interested in people. I always find people and their choices just fascinating. So you get used to the lingo and the behavior and things like that. And it, it wasn't that hard to, to do the acting that you had to do. It was insanely dangerous, and I was always cognizant of that when I did that kind of work. When you said crimes against children, what were you talking about? It's a specialty unit within the person's crimes 
detective department. You know, there's a homicide section, there's a sex assault section. Crimes Against Children is a specialized work because we handle literally all the crimes against children. We're talking about felony crimes, not misdemeanor. We're, we do the big deal of heavy lifting. And that involves interviewing child victims, going after the perpetrators. In Alaska, we uh, would often do that via a surreptitious conversation we'd record. We'd prepare or whatever adult participant we had for it. Or sometimes I would be the actress in that conversation. I did undercover work in that nature. And it's really tough. Um, some of those crimes were physical assault, heinous, heartbreaking physical assaults, but 90% of that is sex. It's sex abuse on those kids. So that was just a really tough area to work in. So what did you do on the case? Did you hear about it from a neighbor or how did you get involved in what was ac what actually did you do? Those calls would come in from all sorts of directions. Most of them come in from a street officer who has taken some complaint from some neighbor or a school teacher or a social worker or a doctor, the school nurse. Somebody has heard something untoward. Some kid has told some other kid something and maybe that other kid who heard it told mom and that mom reported it to the police. So you have to trace it backwards. And every time you get one of those guys, and I'm sorry, it usually is a guy who's that offender, uh, you're saving 50 to 100 kids. But you also have to go backwards and figure, I didn't catch him on my, his first kid. So I want to know about the kid from last month. I want to know about the kid from last year. And I would go backwards on those, on those cases. I, I have to track down where else that guy lived and go backwards and keep finding more victims. So these are pretty much serial offenders. Always, always. You never catch somebody on their first kid. Because I was kind of thinking you were talking about parental abuse, but... Sometimes it is. Sometimes the offender is uh, the parent, obviously. Um, more often than not, it's somebody known to the child. It's the uncle or the babysitter or the neighbor or it's dad or the brother or the uncle. So tell me about, can you think back and think about a describing a case, one of the cases that you had? You know, the, the ones that stick in my mind the worst are the failures, uh, where we didn't get a kid out. I couldn't get a kid out. Um, the, the family packs up and moves, and they're just gone. And hmm. my guess is they hightailed it out of Alaska, and we got a call from Louisiana, because two years later, Dad was doing more with this little girl than he had been when I first tried to stop him. And the, and the failures are just heartbreaking, haunting. I remember feeding that little girl that evening out of my police department's break rooms, vending machines, because by then it's evening. I'm still trying to make this case work. And, you know, I've, I've shanghaied this little 10-year-old out of her family home where she was being abused, and I'm trying to make it work. I'm trying to get enough evidence that we can intervene in a meaningful way, not just overnight or for a few days. I want to stop him. I want to get her in a safe situation. And sometimes you don't have other adults in that child's life that are going to back them up and help them and give them a soft landing. And I was in one of those just awful situations. Most of the time, I could make it work. So do you get into those situations where the other parent, like the mother, is protecting the husband instead of the child? Correct. It's as bad as you're guessing. It's, it's just that heartbreaking. I was listening to the mother berate the child and, and tell her she was lying. And I was certain this child was not lying. We got into that case when an officer called me in over his head because a neighbor had seen sexual behavior between this child and the stepdad in a vehicle. And the neighbor was stunned. She said, I only saw this for a second, but I saw it. And she calls 911 and a street cop goes to her house. And when I we see the kid out front, I, I pull the kid into the girl's house and I take the kid out back and I tried, tried to make that work. And I, I will never forget that little girl arms around me, thanking me as I was trying to help her. That must be heartbreaking. It was just very, very tough. It was so gratifying when you made it work. And I usually did. I could usually fix the awful situations. And it, I had every permutation of it. I had a sister whose 
boyfriend was abusing her much younger sister, a sister who was 10 years younger. And the victim was in that place in her head where she didn't realize she was a victim. You know, she was 13 years old and not seen a problem and flattered by the attention. I mean, I managed to stop that guy. But before that night was over, he did try and kill us. The officer I went to the door with, and you know, we, we just had every permutation you could possibly imagine. So he tried to kill you as you were trying to apprehend him? Yeah, about two in the morning, because you work all night, I've got to make this case work, or we get enough, we're going to go actually put hands on him and, and get him in handcuffs. And we answered the door, and he realized right away what was up, and he turned and ran, and we ran after him, and he almost beat us to a little nightstand. And he got the door open, the drawer of the, the nightstand open. There was a gun in there. He was going to get us. So did you eventually feel that it was just too hard to do anymore? You know, it was just a different time in my career. Um, by that time, I was ready to try supervision. I had done a lot of training uh, with specialty classes and through college. I have a ridiculous number of degrees. And I wanted to try a different field of the work. And I went back to the street as a sergeant after crimes against children. What would you tell our audience, um, you know, that's listening to this, if they got into that kind of situation, what advice would you give them other than just call 911? Is there anything at all that you could do to give them some help? I would urge everybody to not waffle on it. If you saw something and you know what you saw, but it's too easy to tell yourself, well, boy, this is gonna create a lot of waves in my church or the scouting group or with my neighbors or with my family or with my husband's family, make the waves, go ahead and make the waves because there is nothing more important than protecting children. There, there's just nothing more important for all of us than protecting the vulnerable and, and providing that human service to one another. What was the youngest child you ever dealt with in that situation? Uh, in the two range. Wow. Yeah. Yeah, those are very, very hard interviews to do. They can't, they're so nonverbal. And I had a, a very little one who was under five who had clearly been threatened. and. I, I just think uh, it's probably more than most listeners want to hear to know how somebody would threaten a child with, you know, perhaps kill a pet in front of them and say, this is what's going to happen if you tell. You know, this was a terrified, terrified child who put his fingers in his ears. He could not hear what I was going to ask him. Because he was so fearful. Yes. So I, I was sure the guy had threatened him. And then how do you how do you address the parent at that point or the, the guy that they is the perpetrator in a sense? Well, mom had seen something in that case, um, something very foul between the guy and the child. And she was sure what she had seen. And I needed the little one to tell me about this. And now I'm not talking about a two-year-old. I'm talking about somebody who's uh, almost five, and could have described this to me, but that kid had clearly been threatened by the guy, and mom was committed to staying away from that guy forever, but I wanted to charge him criminally, and I've got to at least get someone to tell me else, someone else to tell me something about that occurrence, and I, I, I could be satisfied that the child was not going to be victimized by that guy again, but I, of course, can't be satisfied that that guy's not going to find another child sometime down the road. How uh, successful are you through the court system to actually get something that sticks? Very successful, because by the time I charge it, I have got the evidence, and there is no defense attorney in the world that wants to go up against that. The jury will climb out of the box and hang the guy. They just don't want to do that, but they will fight us tooth and nail before it gets to court. They will try to suppress the evidence. They will try to upset the victims, that they will make them go to the grand jury. They will give those kids a hard time in, at every step. That sounds, you know, it's, it sounds like, of course they would, but you kind of wonder sometimes how long are they put away for? Is it like life or are those crimes more like 10 years or 20 years? More like 10. And 
in Alaska, it's mandatory that they get one third of their time off for good behavior. Mm. Uh, and that, that's a measure to relieve prison overcrowding. There, there's just all kinds of permutations that I think the average person who isn't actually in law enforcement work would go, oh, I didn't realize that happened because people get their education from a television show. Right. Miseducated them. Well, and that's why I'm trying to, to get to the point, you know, where you've really had the experience and I think it would be helpful to other people to hear it and not just rely on the TV or, you know, what they've seen on a program. You're right. You're right. So uh, when you went back to Sergeant, what did you do then? I supervised officers on the street. So I would, uh, I would have up to 50 cops at a time usually much less than that, but usually around 20, uh, working under me in a sector, a half of the city. And so I, I might have a hundred mile swath from the middle of Anchorage all the way out to the next, they don't have counties in Alaska, but it would be uh, the next borough. And so it's a bridge we call the Knick Bridge. I've got everything from that end to this end and everything you could imagine. There's rural parts and there's bears and moose problems and there's drive-by shootings and car crashes and crack dealers and 911 calls of every sort going on constantly. So what do you, how do you coordinate all that? I am a multitasker. I can listen to multiple conversations on multiple radio channels with the guy in, in my car, with the guy outside my window, and just have a lot of balls in the air. And you just keep reprioritizing things and then you hear this other call and you realize that guy needs a negotiator and I know that the one negotiator I have is actually tied up right now with a prisoner but the next shift is coming on so I'll bet you I can call have dispatch call downstairs and I can break one free from the next shift and just lots of balls here all at once and you just keep reprioritizing oops now we have a shooting so I've got to break this guy from this scene and this guy's going to have to do it by himself and I need to send one cop over there. And the, and the cops are great. They're, they're well-trained, they're well-equipped, they're experienced, and they, they know their jobs. But you just keep balancing, keep juggling those balls in the air. So how did you transition into writing? <laughs> well, I had always been a reader. Uh, in young childhood, I even wrote stories, too. And I've just always loved, loved stories. So once I was able to retire, I turned to writing very seriously. I had written one novel at that point already, but I, I kept studying the craft and reading good writing and then sometimes reading bad writing and learning the difference and appreciating it and developing my own voice as a novelist. And I also had a few set ideas for different nonfiction holes I wanted to fill. And I just kept at it until I got there and I, I'm still keeping at it. You just keep writing and honing your craft and putting out stories. I just love it. When you sit down to do a story, uh, does it just kind of come into your head or do you think of the characters first um, before you start writing? Do you just write, flush it out and turn back around and do a different way? How do you do it? Usually characters have been percolating in my head for quite some time before they come out onto the page. And I'll have a germ of an idea and usually there will be an amalgamation of several ideas that start to come in. Different characters will wanna be in the story and different events will occur to me. And I'll sort of get an idea then of is this a story about somebody changing, about somebody not changing, is this a story about people's reaction to this event or did they respond in this way? So it's more of a story about the response. And I will let those ideas cook for quite some time. And when I write, I write pretty organically. I don't write in order. I gave myself permission long ago that I don't have to start on page one with scene one and end up 350 pages later typing the end. I can skip around because although I might not know how we get out of scene two into scene three, I do know that a week later in the story, there's this confrontation where Nan talks to her sister about what happened with the neighbor or something like that. So I can hop to that scene and let it flow. 
Interesting. What kind of hurdles or obstacles, you know, have you had in your life? I think I've faced most of the same obstacles that most of us face. There have been just the odd bits of bad luck. There have been the discrimination that uh, I think most women will face at some point. I've had hurdles that might not have seemed like hurdles at the time, but getting past that event or that time in my life, I've realized, oh, that was actually headed the wrong direction for a while there. So as a, as a supervisor of a lot of, of police officers, many of whom are probably men, did you encounter discrimination? Did you encounter obstacles in that role? Certainly. There will always be for every person, um, people you encounter in your life, work life and non-work life, that will treat you as less just because of something they've identified on you. Or perhaps there's really something in themselves that's motivating them to behave that way. But I was certainly treated as less than by some of my subordinates, by some of my superiors, and by some of my colleagues. Most of the time, with most of the people, there was not a problem, though. I had respect that I had earned, and I was treated accordingly. How did you deal with the problem areas that you had? Do you, like, report them upward in the channel, or how do, how do you deal with that? It depended very much on how severe the context of the persons. Usually I would fix it right then. Some things I would ignore. With a subordinate, I wouldn't tolerate a lack of respect. With a colleague, I wouldn't tolerate a lack of respect. With a supervisor, it would depend on if it was my direct supervisor or whether it was a supervisor that was actually not my direct supervisor so that uh, perhaps the correct chain then is to let my supervisor know this other captain just did this to me or sent me this inappropriate email or whatever idiotic thing had just happened. What, what event or person would you say impacted you the most in your life? I really thought about that because I cannot necessarily identify one most influential person. Um, for 25 years, the biggest rock in the best way in my life has been my husband, Barry. And uh, so I, I suppose that could be him um, because he's, he's my best friend. Uh, in the 25 years before that, I don't think I could pick one person who was the most influential person in my life. I did have a couple of wonderful teachers. I'll never forget Mrs. Kendall, my third grade teacher, who read to us the entire novel, uh, Where the Red Fern Grows. How did your parents feel about you going into something that might not have at that time been more of a women's role? My mother was never thrilled with my choices. Um, she would have preferred me to do a more cerebral, more professional looking career. Uh, me wearing a uniform and going into a job that did not necessarily require a four-year degree was not a choice she was supportive of. But she, on the other hand, it was my choice. So it, in the grand scheme of things, didn't matter that she didn't like it. Uh, my father was deceased when I was, oh, I, in 1989. And how old were you at that point? I was a paramedic. I wasn't yet at the fire, uh, police department, but I was at the fire department. And we were pretty estranged for uh, good, healthy reasons. He, he was not a stable person to be around. And did that have anything to do with the career you chose? You know, I've wondered if the career chose me or I chose it. I, I certainly was well suited for that kind of work. And certainly uh, my younger life gave me a lot to think about um, because I had a lot of unhealthy experiences when I was very young. I, all of us did in our family, and that was just the way it was. And you learn to grow and reflect and walk that path and come out the other side. What kind of unhealthy experiences did you have? Well, I'm a pedophile's daughter. Okay. And that may have affected what you went into then? 
it sure was gratifying to fix those kids' problems, to stop those guys. It really was. And was your father in the household during that time so that you were stuck in the household? Until I was about 10. Yeah, at the time, Arizona didn't recognize no-fault divorce, and it was a difficult thing for my mother to get out of that marriage. What did you feel? Um, did you feel like you were helpless at that point as a child? I was stuck and I knew I was stuck, but I knew then that there would be a time in my life where I was not stuck, where I would get to call the shots about my day and about my month and my year and my work and the choices would be mine. And I was waiting for that. And your mother must have been supportive at that point. She, did she kind of find out what was going on? She didn't know or what happened there? Well, the worst thing that was found out was that my elder sister had been abused for longer than any of us had ever known. I, we, I had no idea, of course, but I, there were things that I just did not understand at all being that young. And so how did you deal with that? Did you go to your mother? I reported things that I didn't, that had happened and that I didn't understand. And I was coming to her with questions of what's going on here kind of thing. And that was the gateway for my elder sister to come forward and, and explain that that had happened to her for years. So she may have felt pretty trapped up to that point. Oh, it, it breaks my heart still. That, that, that she had much more abuse, much longer. Well, and it's so difficult as a younger sister, what do you do about it, you know? Were you just stronger than she, or how did, how did it come out that you got it out? It's hard to know or to put a finger on it. We'd we be merely speculating, and most likely there are multiple reasons at play. Um, she was a stepdaughter not a daughter, and that could have been part of the problem. There can also just be a bit of personality, and personalities can change a bit. People can get uh, more or less introverted and more or less confident at different times in their lives. Their self-esteem can fluctuate, and people can feel more or less ready for the next step that would be healthier in their lives. Did you have a younger sister? No, I, I do now because my mother remarried um, in 08, I think it was, and I finally got a younger sister. She's taller than me, so I'm still the little sister. <laughs> but I have a sister, Carla, now whom I just love. What advice would you give younger women today? I would really encourage women to work on their relationships. And the key thing there is that your most important relationship is your relationship with yourself. If you are not happy with the direction your life is going, that is something you can choose to work on. There are reasons you've made choices that are unhealthy for you or you're sabotaging yourself, but it's a choice. It really is. And you can choose differently. You can work on deficits and you can reflect and grow and you're going to come out the other side in this journey. Just have faith in yourself and keep growing. And do you try to put that in your books? I do. I really do like to give a satisfying, happier end. I want to be hopeful. And sometimes I don't tie up all the loose ends because I am very aware that life will not give you everything in a happy package, in a neat explanation. Sometimes we just have to live with compromises and I'm okay with that. So tell me a little bit about your books. If somebody said, what genre do you write in? What would you say? Definitely my first two novels were what fall under book club picks, you know, the kind of books that are meaty and substantive and there were also classified as crime fiction because the first one was a psychological thriller that was orchids and stone and i followed that with the measure of the moon a psychological suspense that i was really proud of i love that novel um my agent said hey it's time for a series and i wanted to do a mystery series 
that hadn't been done before. And of course, being me, I wanted to do a strong young woman with plenty of room to grow. So I came up with this uh, young woman, high school dropout horseshoer, making her way in the world. And, and she ends up in a town where she doesn't know anybody. Her reason for being there is she has tracked down her childhood horse. And she ends up staying there in central Oregon and creating a life there. I particularly liked Greer in The Measure of the Moon. I really thought you did well. He seemed to have, uh, you know, the holding back and afraid to tell his parents anything for fear they might be killed. Um, that was really, really interesting how you treated that. Did you tell us a little bit about how you went through that? He's a great little hero. Um, the Measure of the Moon is an unusual novel in that it's a split story and readers won't realize for a while why they're reading two novels. You know, there's this woman in Seattle and there's Greer in the country with his big, odd family. And he's the youngest with a bunch of adult siblings and he sees this crime early on and he has to deal with this. And I came up with Greer because I wanted pretty far before we're going to get to that satisfying end. So um, Gillian was your other character, right? Correct. And Gillian, that's where you say you had like two stories going on between Gear, Greer over here and Gillian over here. And we finally figure out where the connection is. I loved that moment. Uh, it was not the connection that most readers had been expecting was going to be the connection between the two stories. And so many readers have said, oh, I didn't get it until I got it. I mean, just really in that sentence that I get it. I, I really wanted to pull that off and I was really pleased that I did. Well, I hope many of our listeners also go in and pick up your books and read them. I certainly enjoyed it, and I'm going to buy more and read more because they're just the kind of stories that I like to read. So thank you so much for being with us today. We appreciate all your insights that you had into many, many different areas. Are you still a sergeant, or are you full-time writing now? Yes, I'm a full-time writer now. Well, good Indeed. luck with all your writing and good luck with whatever you do up there. You're close to Alaska. You're not that far away, are you now? It actually takes as long to drive from northwest Washington to Alaska as it does to drive across the country. Really? It, it, wow. It's about 45 hours of driving. Oh. <laughs> well, thank you so much for participating, Lisa, and good luck with all of the, the writing that you're doing and all the books. You can get Thanks those on so Amazon, right? Correct. Or any right. book sale. We'll list them so people know that they should pick them up and see your interesting twists and turns that you put in. Okay. Thank you so um, much. Bye-bye.